Welcome to module 1.3, how to read a phylogenetic tree. This presentation is a part of the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology Toolkit from CDC's Office of Advanced Molecular Detection. My name is Dr. Michael Wiegand, and I'm a bioinformatician with the CDC. This module is part of our introduction to genomic epidemiology and the SARS-CoV-2 genome specifically. Be sure to check out the toolkit's other modules, which include a combination of case studies and training materials to help get you started supplementing epidemiology with genome sequence data. In module 1.1, we introduce this simple infectious disease transmi transmission network example that you see here, from which only a few infected individuals in blue get sampled for genome sequencing, as is typically the case for epidemic processes like the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Because viruses mutate as they spread, it's possible to use those mutations as molecular genetic fingerprints to infer ancestral relationships among the sampled individuals from the larger network. The process of inferring those relationships we call phylogenetics, and the results are typically visualized with what's known as a phylogenetic tree. This module describes the basics of building and interpreting these trees. We will be going in depth on this topic because a key underlying assumption of genomic epidemiology is that strains that are phylogenetically closer are more likely to share an epidemiological association. In this module, we will talk about four key aspects of this approach. A simple description of how trees are constructed from genetic fingerprints, the different parts of a phylogenetic tree, basics of tree interpretation, and finally, some limitations. Phylogenetics is the study of evolutionary relationships among biological entities. The scope of this training will focus on ancestral relationships between strains of SARS-CoV-2 recovered from infected patients. The approach is analogous to studying a family tree, like the cartoon example here that links you to your siblings, parents, and cousins. We almost always infer these relationships among viral strains by analyzing molecular sequence data. For example, we can compare these four nucleotide sequences from viral strains and infer that virus A is more closely related to virus B. The most common approach to comparing molecular sequence data is by detecting single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs for short. This simple example illustrates a single nucleotide difference, C versus G, between two sequences. Using high-throughput sequencing methods, it's fairly common to identify all the SNPs present in the full genome, which for SARS-CoV-2 is approximately 30,000 nucleotides. The SARS-CoV-2 genome is depicted here with different colors indicating the structural genes, and you can see that comparing all the SNPs detected in many genome sequences can reveal some parts of the genome where the sequence is more variable or more conserved according to the frequency of SNPs detected at those positions. The full collection of SNPs detected across the genome provides a genetic fingerprint for a viral strain. For example, we see the set in the map here of SARS-CoV-2 genome with 10 detected mutations, marking its specific SNP profile or fingerprint. Using high throughput sequencing methods, it's possible to determine these kinds of SNP fingerprints for hundreds or thousands of viral genomes, which can be combined into what we call a multiple sequence alignment, or MSA. MSAs can become very large, but fundamentally, you just need to understand two features about this simple example on the right. First, each row indicates a different viral se strain sequence, and second, the columns line up each corresponding or homologous nucleotide site shared between the strains. So just by eye, you can easily scan down this example along any column to identify SNPs or conserved bases at a particular position in the sequence. MSAs make it possible to perform this comparison for every single column, all 30,000 in the case of SARS-CoV-2 and even millions of columns in the case of bacterial genomes. Comparing genetic fingerprints with MSAs allows us to then measure relatedness between individual strains, as well as build phylogenetic trees. For example, 
Here on the left, we see a matrix of genetic relatedness calculated from an MSA. Typically, these are reported as SNP distances or the number of SNP differences between strains. So each of the numbers in this table indicates the number of sequence mutations, SNPs, that differentiate two strains. Alternatively, on the right, we can use the same genetic fingerprints aggregated into an MSA to build a phylogenetic tree, which of course is the focus of this module. However, note that SNP distances can also be useful metrics for identifying potential case clusters because we expect strain sequences to be very, very similar if the case is shared epidemiologic linkage. Let's look at a simple example of just how phylogenetic trees are grown from a multiple sequence alignment. Here's another MSA that includes the fingerprints of five viral isolates, and the SNPs are highlighted in red to mark mutations compared to the ancestral sequence at the top. The resulting phylogenetic tree on the right represents an approximation of how each sequence is related which is essentially calculated from the accumulation of the red SNPs. The x-axis indicates genetic changes or mutations, and you can see moving from left to right that the black ancestral sequence is slowly replaced by red mutations. The isolate fingerprints are grouped together according to how many of those mutations they share, and the tree building software algorithm estimates the likely intermediate sequences that existed between the ancestor and the sampled isolates. Before we can learn how to interpret phylogenetic trees, it helps to first define some of the key parts. So let's look closer at our example tree from the previous slide. The leaf nodes of the tree are our sequenced samples, marked here A through D. The outgroup, D, is just a special leaf node that represents a sequence sample we know is less related to the others. In this example, isolate D provides a clear separated reference point to help visualize the relationships between isolates A, B, and C. The horizontal branches of the tree indicate genetic distance between each of the nodes. The numbers in this example indicate SNPs. We can determine the total number of SNP differences between any two isolates by simply tracing the path between them while adding up the distance numbers. For example, the distance between isolates B and isolate C is calculated along the red arrows. Five plus one equals six SNP differences. And if you calculate all the pairwise distances between these four leaf nodes, you can recreate a genetics distance matrix for the isolates, just like the one we saw before that was calculated from a multiple sequence alignment. <laughs> This example tree also has internal nodes. These are inferred ancestral sequences that we have not sampled and are not part of our MSA, but our phylogenetic software algorithm tries to make educated guesses about them based on the leaf node sequences. Internal nodes represent the common ancestor for all other nodes to their right. Thus, the labeled internal node in our tree is the inferred common ancestor of isolates B and C. The far left node is a special internal node called the root, which is the common ancestor to all other nodes in the tree. Sometimes the root is a sampled sequence present in our MSA, but often, like the internal nodes, it is not. Lastly, we use the term clade to loosely define any group of closely related sequences. Importantly, there are no strict cutoffs for defining clades, but members of a clade should all share an internal ancestral node. In our simple example here, the box highlights a clade containing isolates A, B, and C, but we could just as easily describe isolates B and C as forming a clade. However, although the distance between isolates A and C is shorter, only three SNPs, they do not constitute a clade because they do not share an internal node, not also shared, isolate B. Notice that we did not define the vertical lines or bars in our example tree. That is because the vertical axis does not mean anything. Its only function is to help space out the leaves, branches, and nodes to make the tree look nicer or easier to read. Only distances along the horizontal branch matter. 
because they represent genetic distance, typically SNPs. We will see later that this access can also sometimes indicate time. Importantly, this means that branch rotations at any of the internal nodes are also meaningless because it doesn't matter which isolate leaf node is listed above or below the others. Just because two nodes or isolates are written next to each other on the vertical axis does not indicate that they are meaningfully related. These three trees on the right are all identical, even though we can change the order of the leaf node labels by rotating branches around the internal nodes. In all three trees, isolate D is most similar to isolate C, and they share a common ancestor. We have been looking at basic rectangular rooted trees, like the one on the far left. This is the most common depiction, but phylogenetic trees can take many shapes. The choice of how trees get drawn in journal manuscripts is often purely aesthetic but these three trees here are all equivalent, and in fact, drawn from the same MSA. A radial tree can sometimes help space out the leaf nodes more evenly, and note that the horizontal genetic distance axis now corresponds to the circle radius. As noted in the parentheses, unrooted trees can be useful in contexts where a specific ancestor or the direction of evolution is unknown, but Using them comes at the expense of being able to clearly identify many of the internal and leaf nodes because they often overlap. You will primarily see rectangular rooted trees throughout this toolkit. A popular web application for visualizing phylogenetic trees is nextstrain.org. This tree application has been widely used for tracking sequences of SARS-CoV-2 and its developers led by Trevor Bedford and Richard Nair are actively maintaining numerous phylogenetic trees calculated from public sequence data repositories. NextStrain is popular among academic researchers and public health laboratories alike, and will be featured in some of the case study modules later in this training toolkit. For an introduction to using NextStrain, be sure to visit module 3.1, and you can find much more detail within the excellent documentation at nextstrain.org. Here's an example tree image drawn using NextStrain, similar to those seen in some of the case study modules. Like our simple trees earlier, the horizontal axis here indicates mutations or genetic distance. You can see groups of leaf nodes in what look like vertical stacks, indicating that isolates with identical sequences. Looking at this tree, we would infer that the big group on the top left contains isolates corresponding to a large cluster like a, of potentially linked cases with identical SARS-CoV-2 genome sequences. The tree also suggests further transmission from this cluster likely led to additional smaller clusters, B and C. Clusters B and C are further to the right in the tree, indicating that additional mutations have accumulated in the viral genome during transmission. We won't go into the details now, but you should be aware that NextStrain, like some other tree visualization tools, can also draw trees with a horizontal axis that indicates time rather than genetic distance. These two trees contain the same isolate sequences, but the branches in the tree on the left are drawn based on mutations, while branches on the right are drawn according to collection date. Importantly, the vertical axis is still meaningless in both trees, but I think you can quickly see that the choice of horizontal axis can change the apparent relationships among the sampled sequences. While mutation rate estimates for SARS-CoV-2 are an active area of study, many researchers in the field have observed the approximate accumulation of two SNPs per month. Such a rate may not provide sufficient resolution in situations of rapid transmission, causing discordance between trees visualized with mutations and collection dates. We'll discuss this in more detail in other modules, but remember to always check the horizontal axis to be certain whether you're interpreting a mutation tree or a collection date tree. Of course, NextStrain is only one application for tree drawing and visualization. Here's an incomplete list of a few others that might fit your particular needs. But importantly, the basic principles discussed in this module can be applied to all of them. 
Let's circle back to our core assumption that strains that are phylogenetically closer are more likely to share an epidemiological association. Certainly, there are caveats and limitations to bear in mind when making epidemiological inferences from phylogenetic trees. For example, it's important to remember that transmission pathways frequently cannot be determined from the tree. This is particularly salient for SARS-CoV-2, which has an approximate mutation rate of only about two SNPs per month. Causal links should not be concluded from sequence data alone and should always be interpreted in connection with traditional shoe leather epidemiologic data. If nothing else, simply remember that phylogenetic trees, though powerful, are only an approximation of the true story of transmission. Coming back to our example at the beginning of this module, remember that the sequenced samples in here in blue are almost always a small fraction of the total epidemic. As a result, the calculated phylogeny contains many gaps in the transmission chain. Both the placement of those gaps and the overall depth of network sampling can have dramatic implications on the resulting phylogenetic tree. In this example, notice that fewer sequence isolates from the orange group in trees B and C changes the interpretation of viral transmission between the orange and blue patient groups. Additional epidemiological data could help resolve ambiguities in these trees, but it's important to always remember that the trees itself is only an approximation. And that approximation is only as good as the sampled isolates in the underlying MSA. To summarize, viruses mutate as they spread, producing a genetic fingerprint. Fingerprints from many sequence viral isolates can be combined into a multiple sequence alignment, or MSA, for comparison. The ancestral relationships among sequences can be represented in phylogenetic trees. And although strains that are phylogenetically closer are more likely to share an epidemiological association, always interpret with caution because all trees are only an approximation of the tree. This concludes module 1.3. Part two of this toolkit contains case studies that review the use of genomics in response to COVID-19. Please visit the COVID-19 Genomic Epidemiology toolkit page where you can find further reading on this topic. While on the toolkit page, you can also subscribe to our mailing list and receive announcements as new modules and materials are released. Thank you.